Good morning, everybody. Okay, I think we're all well and we're all here, so that's great to see. Good morning, I'm Ildi. I'm Ildi Nadia, I'm going to be your host today. Uh, basically, I'm here to make sure that everything runs on time. We're already a bit late, so we're going to catch up. And in case you have any questions, in case you have any questions, then uh, feel free to come to me. Uh, I think I'm capable to answer in two different languages, so uh, maybe a bit of German as well, but I'll try my very best, okay? Uh, Hungarian, English, and German. That's, that's what I will try. So without any further ado, we are looking forward to a very interesting program. So make sure you check that out. We are also going to have that on screen, but also plastered around the entire event space. To, so basically choose whatever you'd like and, and, again, be on time. So without any further ado, let's do the introductions to this wonderful event, the Danube COP 2022 conference. Okay, let's start with an opening by Director of Corvinus University of Budapest, Professor Elu Takács, who's going to make some opening remarks. Thank you very much. Yeah. As you wish. Thank you very much. So can you hear me? So dear distinguished guests, uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome. My name is Elliot Tokac, and it's a pleasure to welcome you all at the Danube Cup Conference on Entrepreneurship and Startup Education. We are grateful to Professor uh, Emeritus Dr. Janos Vecsényi, academic head of our organizing committee, the members of the organizing committee, and all the colleagues who made such an event possible. Hungary's top two universities, Corvinus University of Budapest and the Budapest University of Technology and Economics, have joined forces to organize the Danube Cup Conference. The event aims to highlight trends in entrepreneurship and startup education to share experience and knowledge as well as demonstrate educational practices which can be applied at other institutions of higher education. The instillment of entrepreneurial ideas into higher education has generated a lot of enthusiasm and interest in recent decades. Several effects have resulted from this, including entrepreneurial-driven economic growth, job creation, as well as increased social resilience to shocks such as COVID-19 pandemic and shocks we do have enough. However, results of growth and international success emanating from new ventures located in the Danube region tend to be modest compared to the rest of the world. Therefore, local ventures must think, must think beyond local terms. Yet what we do find is that both of our faculty and students and our society tends to be risk averse, tends to be a bit afraid of the unknown, tends to be afraid of failing, and therefore have difficulties venturing beyond international, beyond national borders to international ventures. The conference therefore presents a great opportunity for all of us to broaden our views and broaden our horizons. The original mission of the Danube Camp competition is to bring student-founded businesses to international success by bringing together the most motivated university startups located on the banks of the River Danube. However, and in addition to that, international cooperation between academic faculty is also necessary to successfully facilitate the international outlook of our students. For the conference today, and all the other events organized under the Danube Cup brand, we are fortunate to have the support of a group of sponsors to whom I would like to extend our thanks. It's a privilege to host you all at Corvinus University for the day. I sincerely hope that you will enjoy today's debates and the networking, and thereby I declare the conference officially open. I wish you a successful conference. Thank you very much for the opening remarks. And the remarks are going to continue because we also have the Vice Rector for Science and Innovation of the Budapest BME, Professor Janusz Lewandowski. Thank you so much. Thank you. I just step here not to lag behind the Corvinus University. So <laughs> on behalf of the Budapest University of Technology and Economics, let me just extend my most sincere welcome to all of you attending this Danube Cup meeting. 
I hope you will enjoy your time in Budapest if you are from abroad, even though the weather turned to be very bleak, unfortunately, <laughs> but it may give you some additional motivation to zoom down to the program of this conference. However, let me just start with a pretty trivial statement. Innovation is a drive of the modern world. This is the buzzword, by the way, which we can hear all around us, and this is which prompts universities to streamline knowledge transfer because they are considered to be the cornerstones of a modern knowledge-based society. And this is quite true indeed, however, there is a single factor which carves out this role for the universities even more predominantly. This is not just about scientific excellence or research results, but there is one thing which all universities around the world have in common. They all have students. And actually, students are the ones who are most likely to develop non-conventional ideas, which are not rooted in traditional frameworks, in traditional way of thinking, and that's why they can pave the way towards the newly emerging disruptive technologies, which in turn can shape the future of humanity. Basically, that's innovation. It boils down to the capacity of developing non-conventional ideas. And that requires a special mindset, a special age, when actually a special period of time when conventional thinking has, has not yet fully imprinted itself upon the personality. And that is the reason why we have to pay a great deal of attention to student innovation and carefully cultivate it, because this is really the key to our future. Now, of course, it is easier said than done. As far as implementation is concerned, one can implement several components of student innovation. For example, one can organize student contests of innovation, like this one, or one can even launch a program to support uh, startups, student startups, by the help of venture capitals. Furthermore, one can teach courses on leadership skills and how to take calculated risk to the students. Even one can create a sort of science park or technology park environment, which naturally draws talents towards innovation. And actually, all these components point toward a single concept, which is often referred to as the entrepreneurial university. Now, as far as the Budapest University of Technology and Economics is concerned, we have all the components in place. We have an incubation program for startups supported by a venture capital. We teach zillions of courses with entrepreneurial skills to our students. Furthermore, we have a science park in the making. However, how to combine all these components in an optimal fashion and how to pursue an integrated approach towards student innovation, that remains to be a challenge and that is to be discussed here and addressed here in this conference. So in that regard, we are quite eager to learn, we are quite eager to rely on your experience in that matter. And with that, I would like to conclude and I would like to wish you very interesting talks and stimulating discussions and enjoy your time in Budapest. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Lewandowski. I think we already heard quite a few teasers of, about today's program. So without any further ado, I would like to ask the academic head of the conference, Professor Emeritus Janos Vecenyi, to also give his opening remarks. Uh, good morning. Uh, after these talks from Professor Tokac and Professor Lewandowski, it's hard to talk something new, uh, something about new things. Um, I would like to highlight only several aspects of this conference. One, that innovation is not enough. Commercialization is making business out of innovative idea is something relevant. Attitude of the students. We can create open spaces, we can create mentoring, whatever. The basic question whether we have students who really want to learn and really want to make something 
valuable and making business. Some of them are engaged with great ideas, innovative ideas, but they hate to make it to the, uh, take it to the marketplace and sell it, which is quite awkward, but we are talking about making business out of innovative ideas. Wherever you can make business, if not in a knowledge-based institution, either, either side of the Danube. So we need, we need entrepreneurial mindset, we need, need, we know the why, hopefully. But what, what we are talking about uh, today is the how and what. And there are several ways. There is no one best, one single best way to teach entrepreneurship. We have different ideas. But as Schumpeter uh, suggested us, by the way, he came from the Danube region. Anyway, so he suggested us to uh, innovation is something of a new combination, not something new, a new combination of different, almost known elements. So we can uh, be here and share different ideas, different teaching methods, different learning methods. We can name different roles in the uh, learning process, whether we have uh, well, we have the students. I don't know whether we can use different names for them, wannabes, or what. Uh, but uh, when I made my presentation for today, I, I thought that I don't know how to call ourselves teachers, instructors, trainers, mentors, coaches, engineering the learning process. So we are engineers by education. I happen to be oh. an engineer. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but my professor who may, uh, uh, who, with whom I made my exam suggested me at the other side of the Danube. Why didn't you go to the other side of the Danube? So I came over and I be became a professor here and now I'm teaching there as well. So uh, that's the combination. That's the new combination. That's what we have to create and make them enthusiastic. Make them really want to be because without them we can be very smart. We can design whatever nice uh, learning programs, MBAs, bachelors, whatever. But the question is what will be the impact? What would be the result? And we will have several great ideas and we are here to share, to listen. We professors like to talk, don't we? But sometimes we have to listen. And this is an opportunity, opportunity where we can listen to each other, start to cooperate, start to collaborate. And I guess this Danube Cup concept will open the window of opportunity even larger. It's not an ivory tower where seven universities of uh, different cities from Regensburg, Passau, Linz, uh, Vienna, Belgrade, and uh, Budapest. We are open for other universities around the Danube to accelerate the entrepreneurship, not just the mindset, but also the practice because in these chaotic societies and world, we need more entrepreneurs and we, uh, we need more entrepreneur startups
to solve the challenges of the countries of the universe. And it's a hard work, but we are here, we are energetic, so why don't we have this conference and at the end I will tell you where will be the next one. Okay? Because there will be, and by the way, in Vienna, there will be the third startup concept con uh, competition in Vienna. So the rally went uh, further. So we started here, and the next will be in Vienna, 31st of uh, May. And you are most than welcome to join us to have students' competition on startups in Vienna and join us to promote entrepreneurship and entrepreneurship education in this region and even further. Thank you very much for coming. And last but not least, I would like to appreciate the job of the organizing team. Without them, nothing would have happened here. So, we teach the importance of teams. And now you can, and you have to recognize, without them, you can be smart, write an article, whatever. But without the organizing team and teamwork, there is no such thing as a conference like this. So thank you very much, first of all, Lotte and the uh, other team members. I, have, I don't want to miss anyone uh, here, so I, I have here, uh, as I mentioned, Loretta Husak, Erika Yaki, Dominika Kostio, Alida Kavalec, Aaron Borda, Christian Puta, and Laszlo Tartman, and Paul Doni. Thank you very much, appreciate it, and without the sponsors. You know, one of the definition of entrepreneurship is using other people's money. <laughs> so that's, <laughs> that's why we appreciate 77 Electronica, Trezorit, Masterplast, Budapesti Kereskedelmi és Iparkamara, who gave us extra mileage to allow us to go forward. Thank you very much, thank you for the team, and thank you for the sponsors, and the two universities, Corvinus and the BME, the Technical University, for their moral and financial support. <laughs> thank you very much, and enjoy the conference. Thank you. Well, thank you very much to all the professors. I think it was very enlightening and very educational, uh, full of interesting topics. Yeah, I, I do, have to, do have to say, I felt like I'm back at school a bit, but in a great way, in a great way. And I think you already also got a glimpse to... It's, it's you. It's oh, that's, that's fine. Um, we already, I think, got a glimpse into how this uh, conference came to life, uh, because it's a very unique predicament of these universities coming together as a former student of one of them. I'm not going to tell you which one. Um, this is a very unique event, so I have to say it really warms my heart to see you all sitting here at one table. Okay, we also have some practical information for today. I know this is the boring part, but don't worry, I will be short. So first of all, uh, you might have noticed, and some of you who are here from Hungary, you know that uh, wearing masks is not obligatory here in Hungary. Um, inside. However, if you feel like you would like to wear masks, you're more than welcome to do so. We also prepared some masks for you at the reception, and also the reception serves as a point of contact. So if you have any questions, you feel lost, like which lecture room to go to, they are the ones to help you out. Uh, in case you don't see me or one of the organizers, they are the ones to help you out. Okay, other important informations for us. This morning is going to be about academics exciting and we are full of interesting program. How to find a program, however? On the previous slide, you already saw a lovely QR code, and that's the one to 
uh, to scan if you want to check how the program is going to run in an online version. However, the program is also printed out, so you can also take notes and make sure you carry it with you to see, uh, to see who is going to present and what the topics are going to be. Okay. In terms of uh, other elements of the program, we are going to start very soon. But other important time um, information for us. At 11 a.m., we are going to have refreshments here at the faculty club. So we would like to ask you to come back, chat about everything that you learn and everything that you discussed, and then go to the next event. Okay, let's talk about the sections. Uh, that's the first program element for today. We are going to have three sections, and section one is going to stay here at the faculty club. Section two is going to go up from the reception. It's going to be, let me just double check, at E67, room E67, and the third one is going to be at lecture room three. This sounded a bit complex. Don't worry, we have slight changes, however, in the section heads. Unfortunately, transportation uh, sometimes tricks us, uh, and one of our section heads is going to arrive a bit later, so we have to wait for him shortly, but luckily, Professor Vecini agreed to step in. So the first uh, part now is going to be that uh, I'm going to ask the section heads just to show themselves, maybe, you know, raise a hand or stand up if you'd like, because the first section is going to be about startup enter entrepreneurship and research here at the faculty club with Elizabeth Berger. Hi, Elizabeth. Thank you very much. So she is going to be the one staying here. So everybody who would like to come to this section, just stay here comfortably. Welcome. Hi. Just stay, take a seat wherever you'd like. And uh, section two is going to be in room E67. Section head is going to be Professor Kai von Levinsky from the University of Passau. Chris Scott. Scott. <laughs> Welcome, Professor. This is going to be entrepreneurship from a broader perspective. I wonder what bro that broader perspective is. Interesting. Let's, uh, I look forward to it. The third section, now, as I mentioned, is going to be Professor uh, Vecinia. It's about best practice sharing, and it's going to be at Lecture Hall 3. So everybody who would like to listen to that section, it's full of interesting talks, just follow Professor Vecinia after this talk. Okay, and I also have a bit of a surprise to you, lastly, which is that you are being streamed because this event is also part of Startup Safari and we are very grateful for their support. And this is a really important thing for us because as the professors mentioned in their talks, these conversations and these talks need the recognition. They need to get to as many people as possible. So... Uh, this event is also going to be something that later can be shared, so make sure you also spread the word, connect with each other, and make this event a memorable one. So thank you very much. Uh, this, is what I would, uh, this is what I wanted to tell you this morning, and now the sections can start. Enjoy and learn a lot. See you very soon. <laughs>
policies promoted in the Republic of Moldova which address to a certain extent directly or indirectly some aspects related to the entrepreneurial education of young people are stipulated in a series of uh, regulatory acts such as Education Code of the Republic of Moldova, Law on Small and Medium-Sized Enterprises. Uh, in uh, 2020, a number of strategies expired, uh, which among other things dealt with the issues of entrepreneurship, education, entrepreneurial competencies, and currently under adoption are Education Development Strategy, Education 2030, uh, which includes priority direction, promoting entrepreneurship and economic education at all levels of the education system within the general objective number one and the national program for the promotion of entrepreneurship and increasing competitiveness for 2023-2027. Uh, its specific objective uh, two, strengthening entrepreneurial culture and capabilities will include a program called Entrepreneurial Education, uh, which will be implemented through four directions. Uh, formal entrepreneurial education, vocational training, encourage university business cooperation and dual education. The approaches and uh, uh, objectives of entrepreneurship education may vary depending on the context and understanding of the co and the co uh, concept uh, in each country. And there are two main approaches. Uh, the first approach refers to a broader understanding of entrepreneurship, similar to that defined in the key European competence, emphasizing entrepreneurship as a key competence, uh, which aims to encourage young people and provide transversal skills for active citizenship, life and work, and the possibly but not necessarily entrepreneurship. And the second approach involves a narrower uh, understanding which focuses on developing the attitudes and skills that young people need to set up and run their own businesses or start a self-employed business. And in Moldova, the broader approach prevails in policy documents. Uh, in order to assess the level of training of uh, entrepreneurial skills and competencies of young people at different levels of the educational system and to estimate the impact of entrepreneurship education on the training of entrepreneurial skills of students, we organized uh, the questioning of students. Uh, the survey took place in 2019 uh, on a sample of uh, 289 persons. Uh, the average age of the respondents uh, was uh, 22 years, the mode was 21 years, and uh, the most major respondent was uh, 36 years old, the youngest 17 years old. And among those surveyed, uh, 58% of the respondents were girls and uh, the 42 boys. Uh, the survey was attended by students from 20 educational institutions from Moldova, uh, of which about 80% uh, of respondents were from higher educational institutions. Uh, about 12% uh, from professional schools and the rest from centers of excellence, colleges and lyceums. Uh, the structure of the sample uh, according to the level of education of the respondents is as follows. Uh, about 58% uh, of their studies at the bachelor's level, 20% uh, at the level of technical vocational education or colleges, 80% uh, in magistracy, 2% uh, in doctorate, and uh, less than 1% of respondents study at high schools or licenses. The majority of uh, respondents, uh, more than 98% who provided an answer, mentioned that within the educational institution, uh, they were uh, where they uh, where they study, uh, there is a discipline on entrepreneurship. 
uh, in different education institutions and in different levels of the education system, the discipline of entrepreneurship is called differently. Uh, the most frequently mentioned names are physics on entrepreneurship and entrepreneurship and leadership. And the majority of respondents indicated the obligation to study these subjects in the educational institutions, and only 9% mentioned the optional nature of this subject. Respondents uh, overall highly valued the discipline of entrepreneurship. Uh, virtually all indicated that the discipline is interesting or very interesting. When uh, assessing the discipline uh, from the perspective of professional or entrepreneurial career, uh, there is an interesting trend, and namely that most respondents consider the use of knowledge gained about the entrepreneurship very useful and useful for career development, and a relatively smaller number of respondents consider useful uh, of the discipline for activity in, on their own uh, without hiring staff. Uh, approximately the same number of respondents rated the discipline as useful for setting up their own business with the hiring of staff and respectively for developing skills that will help them later to self-realize. And uh, from 2 to 9% of the respondents indicated that the discipline was not useful. Uh, before moving to the consider uh, on to consider the development of entrepreneurial competences in students as a result of entrepreneurship education, uh, let's review uh, the definitions of entrepreneurial competences. Uh, in uh, 1920. In 1918, the recommendations of the EU Parliament and the Council on key competences for lifelong, uh, lifelong learning was developed, in which entrepreneurial competence, namely the spirit of initiative and entrepreneurship, was named one of the eight significant competences. And entrepreneurial competence is defined uh, in this uh, recommendation as... Um, I'm sorry as uh, the ability of a person to turn ideas into action. Uh, according to European Entrepreneurship Competence Framework, uh, entrepreneurship is uh, when you take opportunities and ideas and turn them into value for others. Uh, the value thus created can be financial, cultural or social, and Entrecom defines entrepreneurship as a cross-cutting competence applied to all areas of life from caring for one's own development to actively participating in society, entering the labor market as an employee or self-employed person and starting an enterprise uh, of a any nature. Uh, and in the Republic of Moldova, at the legislation level, uh, in the national qualification framework of, the, of Moldova, entrepreneurial competences and the spirit of initiative uh, are named as one of the key competences, uh, which are multifunctional, applicable uh, set of knowledge, skills and attitudes that all people need for self-realization and personal development, social integration and finding a job. Also, the formation of entrepreneurial competences is one of the key objectives of the course uh, Basics of, of Entrepreneurship, approved uh, by the Ministry of Education of the Republic of Moldova is in uh, 2015. If you could now maybe wrap up and come to the, your main conclusion, I think time's slow oh, up Oh, okay, already. okay, okay. I'm sorry, yes. So ju maybe uh, jump to the, the here, uh, here, here yeah. we see that the uh, discipline on entrepreneurship uh, influenced on the formation of entrepreneurial competences of uh, the students which participated in our questionnaire. And uh, not only the uh, discipline on entrepreneurship, on entrepreneurship, but and other disciplines from uh, economic and uh, legal uh, uh, sides. Uh, so we see that uh, a bit uh, much than half of respondents uh, say that yes, they have entrepreneurial competences uh, due to uh, uh, disciplines of entrepreneurship. That, that they started. 
And uh, at the same time, uh, not all uh, respondents uh, consider entrepreneurial competences to be equally used, uh, useful in all areas of life. And uh, we see that uh, the students uh, think that uh, entrepreneurial competence will be more useful for them in such areas as the development of leadership qualities in the labor market, in social life, but uh, in, less, uh, in less extent in politics and in family. Uh, so uh, not all students uh, understand the broader extent of uh, this um, concept. Uh, and uh, we see that uh, the most of students plan after the completion of their studies to start a business uh, on their own or to develop a business with hiring staff. And uh, please uh, pay attention on the dark blue graph. Uh, these are those students who confirmed uh, that they have um, entrepreneurial competence competencies and uh, here we see that first of all the entrepreneurial competencies are um, 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 uh, um, relevant uh, are the element of doing business but not in other um, spheres of life okay and, uh, I think uh, we really should have some time to discuss your results and I think that was already this quite is, interesting yes. and, and here the last the last slide I'm sorry the last slide shows us that uh, one uh, uh, fourth of the respondents show that their professors from um, uh, their uh, educational institutions um, are the source of motivation for starting a business for the students and uh, this uh, uh, fact also proves that uh, the discipline on entrepreneurship significantly influenced the respondents' desire to get involved into business. Okay. Uh, I thank you for your attention. Yes. Thank you for that very motivating last statement, I think. So maybe have a applause from everyone and we have a couple of more minutes uh, for questions. I, I don't think we've got another ma microphone, so I will just try to repeat what people are saying about your presentation, okay? Okay. Any questions you've got? Any comments, maybe with regard to that last idea of professors being motivating entrepreneurial um, leaders, inspirers, maybe, maybe there's another word to add to having teachers, instructors, enablers, inspirers, source of motivation. So are these professors who might be motivating coming yep. from practice or coming from the academia? Okay. Okay. I'm not sure whether you understood that, but we're no, wondering no. whether uh, you had um, have any idea whether the students in classes get in touch with other entrepreneurs or whether um, they have the opportunity to get to know entrepreneurs. And this might be actually the source of motivation or inspiration where they're being um, enthusiastic about entrepreneurship. Is that something you asked? Um. Uh, during our survey, we asked our students uh, uh, in what uh, in what methods what methods are used uh, during uh, studying entrepreneurship, and unfortunately, practical methods uh, are not so uh, de developed in our educational institutions. So, unfortunately, uh, during their lessons, the students uh, can not, in the most cases, uh, practice. Uh, um, some steps of uh, doing entrepreneurship mm -hmm. uh, only in uh, th theoretical lessons. Okay. Uh, but they study uh, legislation, they study uh, the necessary procedures, but uh, unfortunately um, practical uh, uh, entrep entrepreneurs are not uh, very often um, uh, are not uh, often visited uh, our students. 
Okay, so this this is something there. we know from research already that uh, teaching about entrepreneurship is one thing that can be quite helpful, but what's even more effective to be teaching with entrepreneurship and having okay. formats where we are get students involved, where they get to try entrepreneurship and not only learn about that. And one very effective way is then to um, invite along role models, for instance, other entrepreneurs, um, so this is maybe something a Im or a implication you could take away um, also from your analysis of um, the entrepreneurship education situation in Moldova at the moment. Of course, of course, you are right, and it was one of our proposals after uh, finishing this project uh, to uh, continue developing uh, meetings uh, face to face of students and uh, uh, real entrepreneurs. Yeah. Uh, to give them uh, the experience. And then just one more remark before we uh, go on to the next presentation. I think it might be quite helpful for you to check out the guest survey. The guest survey is a student survey that looks at entrepreneurial intentions and entrepreneurial behavior at higher education institutes. Um, I think they've got by now maybe almost 50 uh, countries in there. And what's really nice about that is that you have scales developed within the guest survey, and this is something you could also uh, apply to Moldova and then have also enable international comparison, which is the nice thing, um, but also um, have yeah, results which uh, point towards causality, but, because I think this is something that is not possible from the survey you've did so far. So the guest survey, GUE, uh, triple S, might be quite interesting there. So Thank you. thanks again, um, and we will now uh, move on with the presentation on site, which is, I think, very exciting. We've had a lot of teams meeting, but nevertheless, it was great having you, Natalia, and I think you, you're going on. So thanks a lot for being here today, and we will I'll now. Try. I'll try. I'll try to uh, uh, return to the conference. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So we we'll, I think we'll need to, or you, you mute yourself, and then we can continue with the next presentation. So I'd like to welcome everybody, uh, all the participants and all the, all the speakers as well. My name is Balázs Fazakas, I'm from the University of Debrecen, and I'm going to present the paper and the work that we did together with my colleague and my former PhD supervisor, Ms. Patricia Becskinaj, about the role of government venture capital in entrepreneurship and startup financing. So we are approaching the entrepreneurship topic from a specific field of entrepreneurship about venture capital funding. And the presentation itself is structured in two parts. The first part of the presentation focuses on our academic research regarding the field. And in the second part of the presentation, I'm going to introduce how we can utilize these research findings in the education of venture capital. So first of all, the topic and our research field, the government-backed venture capital. And why are we putting emphasis on this uh, field? First of all, if we, if we analyze the Hungarian venture capital market, basically the first question that rises is the role of government, as if we take a look at the progress of the past decade, well, the role of government-backed venture capital funding was probably the most significant form of uh, VC in terms of the Hungarian market. And it would be an overstatement to say that government-backed venture capital funding brought to life the Hungarian venture capital market, but the activity of the market was increased significantly after, in 2010, government, uh, Hungarian government funding and EU funds appeared in the market. And therefore, it created a significant activity that could be analyzed and that could be translated into materials that might help in the education of the startup and entrepreneurship financing uh, courses. And when we talk about the government's role in the entrepreneurship, well, I guess that the startup firms and the venture capital plays a very important role in innovation, growth, and employment as well. Therefore, its uh, analysis has a very important role in the education itself as well. And the question arises, why do we need government in the venture capital market, 
Well, usually we could say that uh, the more the market can solve by itself, the better it is. But whenever market imperfections arises, then the role of government might increase. And that's the case with the start of financing because so many market imperfections arise in this market, information asymmetries, uh, adverse selection, the economies of scale problems, um, the spillovers of innovation, so many market imperfections that makes the capital, capital allocation into the private VC market suboptimal. And therefore, on the short run, the government as a catalyst might play a role in the development of the venture capital market and in this way can add a significant element to the healthy entrepreneurial environment. And our finding uh, about the government's role, which is in consensus with the international literature, is that on the short run, as a catalyst, government-backed venture capital can play a positive and important role on the VC market. And whenever we take a look at the active uh, VC and entrepreneurial environments, we see that in the, in the beginning of the development of VC markets, we could observe some uh, government funding and government support regarding the field. But of course, if we take a look at the long run, the goal of the government venture capital funding is to make the room and to make the ground for a private venture capital funding. So on the long run, the government can play uh, effectively only a supplementary role. But on the short run, it might have a positive impact. And that's why we are turned towards the analysis of government-backed venture capital funding and on the basis of Hungarian evidence, we analyzed what forms of government funding can be, uh, what form is a more effective way to support the entrepreneurs and venture capital firms. And in this way, we analyzed the Hungarian venture capital investment made since 2010 in the form of hybrid venture capital funding and purely government-backed venture capital funding. In case of the hybrid funding, we observed the Jeremy funds that were the cooperation of private and public participants. Public funding and private funding provided the capital that was invested by private investors in turn in case of the Jeremy funds. On the other hand, in the same time, a significant player on the domestic market was the Seicheny Capital Fund that provided purely government-backed venture capital funding. And our major, major question was which form of VC funding proved to be more efficient. And our initial idea was that the appearance of the private interest will lead to a more efficient funding tool for young enterprises. But our analysis showed another result. And uh, as we have a uh, limited time, I don't want to go into the detailed discussion of the methodological uh, description of our analysis. I would only emphasize our major finding. And our major finding could be observed in the upper line. So the key role in our analysis was the AGVC, which was a dummy variable describing the participation of the, government, of the hybrid government venture capital funds. So our initial idea was that when a hybrid venture capital fund appeared, it proved to be a more efficient uh, funding tool. Therefore, we expected a positive coefficient for the hybrid participation. But on the other hand, our results showed that the hybrid venture capital funding had a negative coefficient in our analysis, which meant that purely government-backed venture capital outperformed the hybrid venture capital funding, which was a surprise for us, but it was strengthened by all the specifications of the model. So even in terms of sales, employment, uh, income, in the asset value, in every aspect, we find that hybrid venture capital funds, funds underperformed the purely government, venture, purely government venture capital funding. And for that, we found many reasons the regulation of the program, probably the oversize, the oversupply of capital, the unpreparedness of the market for such a high volume of capital. Uh, many, many reasons could be observed regarding the underperformance of hybrid venture capital funds. 
but uh, probably the major finding connected to the actual topic of the conference regarding the education of entrepreneurship is that both the entrepreneurial and both the and also the investor side was unprepared for managing such capital and we can say that still the Hungarian venture capital market even though it's improving rapidly still is somewhat over the infancy of the market, but still in an early development stage, which led us to the finding that basically the knowledge about venture capital is low, the readiness for venture capital investment is also low, and that is one aspect that hinders the, the, effect, the effective investment of capital. And uh, that's the point when the education might play a role in our in our, um, in our programs, in our studies, uh, there are multiple courses when we are educating the venture capital, different forms of it from a financial, from an entrepreneurial point of view. But uh, to summarize our results, I would say that probably the major questions in education and the first step is raising awareness toward venture capital and how it operates. Because many times, when we study, there is an actual course about venture capital. The first question is, are you familiar with bank loans? Of course, everybody is. Are you, are you familiar with capital lease? Everybody is. Are you familiar with venture capital? And the answers at this point are very mixed. And even though we are teaching in the business, uh, business faculty, at least two thirds of the students probably heard about venture capital, but to say five sentences about venture capital funding would be, well, an unsuccessful endeavor. And that is the main challenge here, to put together the venture capital funding and in our uh, course also from an entrepreneurial and also from a financial point of view. And uh, the key here, connecting to the previous uh, uh, presentation, putting empiric empirical results to the field bring the topic closer to the students. And one of the methods that we are using for that is the case study collections and uh, analyzing actual investments. And therefore, students can see in reality how venture capital works. And the key finding or the major challenge in this sense for our side is, and what we try to emphasize in the education of venture capital related courses is the flexibility. So compared to all the other funding tools or compared to all the other entrepreneurial fields, when we talk about startups and young firms, the major question is to adapt to that flexibility that is required in this field because probably there is no other field of entrepreneurial uh, system is uh, exposed to such rapidly changing environment that makes the flexibility of the field uh, inevitable. And... Uh, that was the end of my presentation, so thank you for your attention, and um, I'm, I'm, I would be glad to answer your questions if you have any. So thank you, and I'm waiting for your questions. Yes, for the, the raising awareness for venture capital is, is a first step and, and to, to increase the awareness for venture capital is, is a first step to make the enterprises ready for, well, as, first of all, to know that there is an option for that and to understand what option they will face when they turn towards the venture capital fund. Uh, yes, um, well, uh, the, the key finding is that after the Jeremy funds appeared and also Seicheny fund and there were other private investors as well, and in the meantime other elements of the startup, uh, startup ecosystem like accelerators uh, and incubat incubators appeared. Uh, all of them provide different services. So I will have different potential when I turn towards, for example, an international venture capital fund. I will have different uh, possibilities. There will be different requirements towards me when I turn toward a purely government 
found. And after such an experience that we had in the past decade, we can mention special bullet points that we have to put more emphasis when we turn towards a Jeremy fund, a government fund, or, or a private fund. And we have to be aware of what do we want to know. For example, if I'm more focused on uh, a domestic market, I won't, be interested in, I won't be interesting for the international investors, so I shall not even start the process. If I'm interested more in the domestic market, probably uh, an, as an economic policy goal, the government funding will be more available for me. But in that case, I must be aware that what are the strict legal and uh, business requirements that they put towards me. For example, I mentioned the flexibility. The flexibility in case of a government fund and in case of a private fund will be absolutely different. Therefore, I must know what I'm turned towards when I look for the venture capitalist. And we have the experience after the past decade to say not everything about these types, but to have a more accurate picture about the actual landscape of the domestic market. Thank you for the question. I think doing research on venture capital is quite um, nice because, uh, first of all, there's been a lot of interest in that. And we ask all the time, what do entrepreneurs need? And they tell us money. Uh, so venture capital is interesting. And then governmental backed or government backed uh, venture capital funds is actually, and I think you pointed that out quite well, interesting because it's sort of is a little bit of a paradox, almost a contradiction towards that entrepreneurial spirit and entrepreneurs will find money themselves and they don't need the government, they don't need the support, they will find uh, the idea will be great enough so they can get money from the uh, from the market but then governmental back to venture capital is uh, something in between. Then the other nice thing about venture capital research is that you can do, do uh, you can do quantitative stuff. You can actually test your hypothesis and um, provide empirical evidence for that. And another thing is that it enables you to do international comparison. And this is something I'd I'd be interested in um, to see whether you've compared your results to other countries where such uh, governmental venture capital backed um, funds were set up or whether you've looked into that because there is of course lots of research also on government backed venture capital funds. Yes, the international results are somewhat mixed. So what is, well, in, in around 90% of the studies strengthens the idea that private venture capitalists overperformed government backed venture capitalists. But when we specify the question which, whether which form of government funding was uh, superior, in that case, uh, the, the background of the government-backed venture capital will play an important role. When we have a speci specified government-backed agency uh, connected to the, to the, to the industry uh, chambers, many times they have the, the knowledge uh, that that is inevitable for VC funding, and when we have specified government-backed funding, it might over it, it creates a better performance than uh, a general uh, hybrid funding. But then again, the results are mixed. But in most cases, I would say that hybrid fun funding altogether proves to be a better funding form. But then again, it, it, it depends so much on the actual background of the actual government funding and the actual specifications of the of the of the of the hybrid funding. So, if you're looking into publishing your study, I guess it would be a lot more into going into those. How are you contributing to those mixed results so far? Yes. Yeah, so, basically, in our study, we made a case study about the Hungarian market which is useful because uh, we have the actual agenda points of these government, aid, uh, government programs and therefore we can analyze them which was a contributor which contributed to the positive side of the thing and we can also see what are those aspects that hindered the efficiency of the market thank you very much once Okay, good morning everyone, my name is Diana Becke, uh, my supervisors are Andrea Schoyam and Andrea, uh, you asked me clear, and now I'm going to talk about what managers can learn from uh, knowledge-intensive technology startups, 
and uh, we are going to uh, look for the answer for the question uh, on, on what level they actually do it, they actually learn it in their uh, management education time. So today I'm going to talk about a startup model from an earlier uh, study that we have developed. Then I'm going to tell a few words about the research methodology. Uh, and sorry. And uh, later uh, we actually going to answer the research uh, questions. And in the end, I'm going to uh, tell you uh, further recommendations for education development. So let's uh, start with the startup learning model. We have two research questions. Uh, our study investigates what organizational learning patterns, like special patterns, uh, have, uh, do entrepreneurs have? And what is the skill set uh, of these knowledge intensive startups? And the next question is whether or on what level these kind of skills and abilities are present in, uh, in our education, in uh, Hungarian higher management education. So the first question about the patterns of uh, entrepreneurial learning. Uh, just a few keywords and names from uh, the topic, the theory of organizational learning. You might have heard of algeries, single loop learning, double loop learning, uh, proposed and process values, system dynamics, Zengi's uh, um, creative capabilities, the art and practice of the learning organization. And these uh, are the two uh, models that uh, we have built our model on. One is uh, Zenga's uh, component technologies, the five disciplines of the learning organization, and the other is Garvin's uh, building blocks, which uh, both work very well for corporates, but we found it important to find a similar model for, um, for entrepreneurships and startups. So this is our models. Uh, after uh, analyzing a bunch of uh, uh, empirical studies of startup learning, we found these five pillars of uh, startup learnings. First, uh, ambidexterity and different kind of decision making and learning styles of entrepreneurs. The second is about the communication role and the vision setting uh, role of business model development. The third is uh, failure culture, uh, the role of experiential learning. The fourth is benchmarking and the outer forms of, uh, of learning, so openness to learning from others. And the last one is the logic of uh, the agile product development frameworks that are built on a validation logic, build, measure, learn logic. And the other axis of the, uh, of the model is the levels on what we have to inquire these uh, pillars, behavior level, values, skills and systems. And in this way, uh, the model serves as a um, pair of glasses or a lens for inquiring startup learning. Uh, the literature provides us uh, many different principles in, uh, behind these uh, pillars. Uh, this is just an example of uh, failure culture and experiential learning, but the rest is in the backup, so if you have questions later, I can show them. Let's jump to the research methodology. Uh, the next question is uh, whether or on what level improvement of these skills, if we accept that these are uh, important in successful startup development, so on what level these skills are, in, uh, are present in our management uh, education in Hungary. Uh, the research pro process started in an earlier uh, systematic uh, literature review of a uh, bunch of uh, st uh, empirical studies of startup learnings uh, in, in two year, uh, ten years. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, the sample, so the field of the research was Corvinus Universi University of Budapest and it was the master's programs that we inquired. Uh, the data gathering uh, was uh, mainly uh, semi-structured uh, in-depth expert interviews with professors of the university and startup experts who are responsible for different master's programs. And we also conducted a supplementary document analysis of uh, major development reports and courses syllabus. And in the end, uh, we coded uh, the data of the transcripted uh, interviews. And a further research field can be other universities, of course. So these are the, the interview questions that I'm going to refer to in the following. So now I'm going to jump uh, to the next slide. 
Uh, so what are the main outputs of uh, the research? We identified three of them. The first is uh, some insights of the Corvinus ecosystem as a whole. The second is our, as educators, uh, practical understanding of uh, the different pillars. And the last one is actually the answer to the research question, so the strength of uh, our majors uh, in this kind of uh, abilities. Now I'm going to talk about these uh, in a few details. The first is about the startup ecosystem. First, I asked the, ex, uh, the respondents to talk about their experiences of the culture of startups uh, appearing in our university. And it turned out that uh, our ecosystem is quite fragmented and island-like. Island so there are many organizations dealing with startups, but they are not really connected. And sometimes they only know about each other from gossips, which is, which is uh, quite uh, important to know. Another uh, finding is that it is m still mostly a trendy topic and uh, only hard skills are supported by education, uh, soft skills not really. Um, the values and mindset, uh, however, are there, has arrived to our university and, um, and there are uh, topics around that. And there are many incubation programs and support. There are many uh, actors in this area. Uh, so only communication is needed. And I could also visualize these uh, findings in a uh, word cloud. Uh, the next is the, our, our, as educators, practical understanding of the principles uh, that has give another layer to the theoretical model that we have built. So I'm going to show a few exciting ones. As for the entrepreneurial learning, the general skills were really uh, much emphasized. As for business model development, the change of business models was an extra uh, critical thinking towards uh, business model was, was a great strength. Also, failure culture, we have a, 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 um, the same understanding actually about benchmarking and learning from others. The openness of this new young generation was uh, emphasized in the interviews. And as for agile product development, there are very different understandings of agility. So that was also interesting. And what was the answer to the actual uh, research question? Uh, so I've mentioned that we have inquired the three master uh, majors and uh, Corbinus ecosystem as a whole. Uh, as a notable uh, strength, we can say that benchmarking is really um, uh, much, uh, much strong in our university. We have guest lecturers, entrepreneurs, we work with and discuss uh, case studies. So uh, benchmarking is also explicitly in the, in the curriculum. Uh, that is a strength. What is a, what is a weakness, on the other hand, is uh, about um, the experiential learning aspect, of the culture of failure, um, which, which is actually um, a weakness. Um, entrepreneurial learning is there. Uh, critical thinking is the most uh, important uh, from this aspect. Um, business models are there, some outdated business models are present in our educational materials, but uh, still uh, there in some way. And as I mentioned, agile product development, agility has very different understandings on the different uh, majors. And I'm going to show just a few examples, a few uh, citations uh, from the interviews uh, to, to make it uh, clear what I'm talking about. First, I mentioned that uh, critical thinking is important, entrepreneurial skill, but, uh, but we can see that, uh, and we had to understand that leadership and management and marketing masters are mostly corporate majors, and it's a decision about that, and with a model like this, we can, we can serve uh, to them as uh, an example to follow or to learn something from, uh, from uh, startups. And uh, in, this, in this way, for example, business model is uh, for marketing students is only a context that they have to work in or they, have, they, cannot, they cannot formulate it actually. Uh, and it is uh, the entrepreneurship development major that has the space for strengthening the startup learning based uh, education. And I think the university should uh, recognize that they should put a more focus on it. Um, as for failure, just a 
few sentences. Uh, thank you. As for failure culture, we don't teach students to fail, actually. Uh, only a few case studies discussing uh, failures. Um, there are some self-reflection tasks and in initiatives. It is a processed value, actually. It is in the mindset. But on a behavioral level, um, just ask the question, who would talk about a failure, a failure uh, in an entrepreneurship? So it's a, it's a hard point. And uh, I mentioned it's always about benchmarking. We should instead look in ourselves uh, again. And some just the further recommendations. What should be done and what should be developed in order to make students learn these kind of uh, abilities? Uh, I have uh, five uh, recommendations. Embracing mistakes, focusing more on the entrepreneurship development program, more entrepreneurship activities in the curriculum, make students work together more interdisciplinary, inter-majors, inter-specializations, and also linking the Corvinus ec ecosystem uh, with a, some kind of a single point of uh, contact. And thank you for your attention. I look forward to your questions. Projects. So involving students uh, into academic or, or institutional research project, can we, can we teach them also to these skills, knowledge, entrepreneurs, skills or something? Yeah, I actually do think so. If we, if we give the space and the time frames for, for uh, evalu evaluating their work from time to time, so, so make them have many failures. There are some uh, good examples on the marketing uh, masters as well for this uh, uh, in project works. So have to so make them have many failures and and give them time. It is hard because because uh, I also uh, teach and we see that like for example we have 70 students at uh, at one semester, which is hard to to give them time. But uh, but if it becomes better as the university wants it. Uh, uh, it can be it can be better so if we have more time for students then we can uh, we can make time for smaller failures and not just like teaching them for success and like like uh, year end uh, have evaluation if you if you see what I mean so that's what I believe actually okay link to that I've got a question because um, I mean failure teaching failure is something we're all interested in and you suggested to do more of that but all the suggestions by their um, participants of your interviews they were more along the lines of teaching about entrepreneurial failure right so we should hear about failure of others we should hear the failure stories do you think or do you have any maybe tasks or experience you want to share of how we can teach entrepreneurial failure um, in terms of making students experience that failure so actually failing and then learning from that failure yeah uh, of course as I mentioned project works project type of works working together with companies and and each other so that's that's a uh, one task I think and also uh, which is not like experiencing themselves but I but I think it wouldn't be that hard to to write a case studies and uh, actually I got motivated to work together with my colleagues and write uh, case studies of failures or or look for uh, guest lecturers uh, talking about talking about their failures but I think uh, to experience that, it is only about more and more project works. There are really good initiatives in the university, but it's still not enough, I think. But are those projects really uh, looking at failure, or isn't it that no. if you want to, if you invite companies or startups and uh, you get students to work with them, of course you want them to be successful. In the end, of course, they can make small f uh, failures or make errors. But is there really a good project work where students experience failure rather than success? Yeah, actually, for example, I had um, on my master's, I had a great um, 
a course uh, called organizational learning that I, that's what I that's where I got the inspiration so that was actually it was it was uh, not uh, not a mainstream course that was actually about uh, the, the assignment and the whole course uh, was about our learning uh, process so the assignment was about the learning process and it 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 didn't matter so it, it wasn't like okay you you had a mistake you get a you fail the course or something like that so so i think that's a good example um yeah that's a tough question actually but uh yeah um yeah so if anyone has experience or want to, wants to share that later on i think what you pointed out nice. yeah. um was quite nice that it's not about failing in life failing a course but that they are different shades of failure let's say yeah that's true yeah that's true learning learning processes okay thank you very much